All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, so tonight for Dharma Doors, we're going to continue reading the sutta that we started last week. It's it's actually, if you if you were to really read it in its entirety, it's a very long sutra, but let me kind of explain why that is. So... Uh, and if you didn't happen to come last week or you haven't watched last week, we shifted to a new collection of the early suttas. So we moved to the Majjhima Nikaya, the, the, what are called the middle length discourses of the Buddha. And I decided to just read this one. We're, we just started with the first sutta in the collection. So last week I read the beginning of this um, Sarva Dharma Mula Pariyaya Sutta, the discourse on the root of all things. And I read the first part of this, and then we paused and we got to talking about it. But the reason why I mentioned a moment ago that this is actually a very long sutta, it's because the first one, two, about the first four pages that I read last week, it kind of goes through, well, everything. <laughs> this is the, the, the root of all things. So it goes through sort of all these possible states of existence from the existence as the four elements, to existence as a being, to existence as a god, to existence in a meditative state. And what we were reading, or again, what I read last week, was how an untaught, ordinary person who observes the four elements, or who observes beings, or who observes gods or meditative states, it's the untaught ordinary person, what we read, is that when they perceive earth element or beings or what have you, they perceive themselves as being of the earth element, for example, or being in the earth element, or being not the earth element, or they think the earth element is mine. They delight <laughs> in the earth element, it said. So that was sort of the problem with the untaught ordinary person, is the all of these ideas of the self, the self being, in the elements or being in a personhood or being in a different state of being or what have you. Now, I read all four of those pages that go through all of these different aspects of being. And what we read was how it is that the untaught ordinary person kind of gloms on to those things as self. Now I did mention the next section of the sutta, which is about the, the disciple in higher training. Now, what I didn't do, though, last week was I should have recited the entire four pages again. <laughs> but I would have then uh, restructured the language so that it wasn't about an untaught ordinary person thinking that they are the earth element. No, someone who's in higher training would directly know the earth element and they should not conceive of themselves as earth. They should not conceive of themselves as in the earth element. They should not conceive of themselves as apart from the earth element. They should not conceive the earth element to be theirs, to be mine. Someone in higher training should not delight 
in the earth element. And that goes for water and fire and wind and beings and gods and meditative states and all four pages of text. And then tonight, what I want to talk about is the arahat, the noble one. And I want to discuss the language here about how the arahat thinks of or approaches these same list of things. So I'm going to go through the list again. I'm going to go through everything again. But what I'm not going to do, though, is I'm not going to recite the whole four pages again. Because if I were going to read this sutra in its entirety, I would repeat those four pages. What? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven like seven times, which would make this a very long sutta if you were to do that. So rather than that, because I read the first kind of part of it last week, let's just dive back in to the basic ideas of the sutta. I'm going to actually begin with the title again, because I didn't say everything I, I kind of wanted to say about the title last week. So... This sutta is called a Pariyaya, and a few weeks ago, maybe even a month ago now, we read the famous, what is it, the Aditya Pariyaya Sutta, I think it's called, the Fire Sermon, the Fire Sutra. And what we learned many weeks ago is that that word Pariyaya, it means like a a teaching, a discourse. It gets translated as a sermon, which of course is a very like Christianized way of talking in that sense. But what I've mentioned in the past is that this Pali word, this Sanskrit word, pariyaya, well, in the Chinese tradition, it gets translated as a Dharma door or a Dharma gateway. And it's where we kind of get the, the, or where I get the name of these Sunday night sutra study classes, Dharma doors. It actually comes from this term, Pariyaya. So this is a Pariyaya, it's a discourse, but it's a discourse on the mula, the root of Sarva Dharma, of all Dharmas. So this is the, the sutra on the roots of everything. The only thing that I want to mention without going too deep into it right now, and one moment, Richard, I just want to mention, actually, I, Richard, let's, uh, let me adjust your question because it might be totally relevant to what I'm about to talk about. So please. So in Buddhism, is this the highest level? Is what the highest level? The Arif ah, the, the Arif um, number one, or I... Great question. What's the highest level? In this? <laughs> so oh, you don't it's, know. Okay. it's a great question. It's a complicated question. It's very relevant to tonight's conversation because I do want to talk about the Arahat. It's a complicated question, Richard, of course, because it depends upon who you're talking to or who you're learning from in that way. And what I mean by that and yeah, let me just dive into this right now. Then we'll pick up on the mula. Well, you can only talk, you can only get the information from someone who's actually living it. Oh, sure, right? sure. You can't oh, yeah, get yeah, it yeah. from a book or through secondhand knowledge. You have to maybe meet somebody who's actually living the truth. Oh, sure. sure. And well, now it sounds like we have two questions. See, because my next follow-up question was going to be, if this is the highest level, what will bring us to it now? <laughs> Not later not tomorrow not next week yeah yeah now in this meeting i'm with you and we're i'm going to do my best in that way i was just going to mention that your question sort of there's one which is like a technically would be called a categorical question which is like technically speaking is a tathagata higher than an arahat what about a bodhisattva like so there's taxonomical categorical questions 
And that's what I meant by it's going to depend upon who you ask because different schools are going to have different definitions of that. But then you raise this interesting question of like, no, 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 no. Like what's really the highest level? And that's no longer a categorical question. That's a question of, that's a question I can't answer. But I will attempt to give you some interesting approaches. Very quickly though, actually, yeah, let me, I'm gonna stay right on this, Richard. Let's just go with the flow in that sense. So, Last week, if, if you listened, if you were here, we heard about how the untaught ordinary person basically thinks of or mistakes all of these different things as self. Then we come over to oh, the section that we didn't get to last week. And it's uh, verse 51 here. And it's about the Arahat, the Aranhat, this Arya, this noble one, this worthy one. So really quickly, in the, well, in what I have learned of the Theravada tradition, which is this kind of particular holdover remaining tradition of what is sometimes called the Hinayana, but this kind of earlier form of Buddhism, Basically, the highest level, Richard, in that sense, is this arahat, with the exception of a Buddha, a what what it will be called in our text a tathagata, a thus come one. Now, in the traditionally, as I have learned it, in that Theravada tradition. We normal, regular people cannot become Buddhas or Tathagatas. The appearance of a Tathagata or a Buddha in the world is a rare, rare, rare occasion. For us right here, right now, like if you're listening to this, it means you're not a Buddha. You would know it already. So the best Hope is to learn from the teachings, the Dharma of a Buddha who came into the world. And in that tradition, again, the more earlier Theravada type tradition, the best we can hope for, the highest level we could attain is an Arahat. And that's what we're going to read about tonight or what we're going to focus on tonight. That belief blocks you Say again, from discovering that that belief prevents inquiry that that might be false and to find the truth of the matter. Which See, we, you've already which... read in a book and you listen to what the authorities have said and you believe it now, it's a belief. And the very belief prevents inquiry and Wait, prevents I... to see the truth. Yeah. You see? Are you, you addressing me, Richard? Well, anyone. Anyone <laughs> okay. who is yeah. full up with instructions, right? Full of yeah, yeah, yeah. ideas, beliefs, concepts, right? I'm talking about the average person, right, who's been programmed like a robot. And I'm yep. talking about liberation, total liberation from the saying. accumulation of memories, which impinge upon the brain mm -hmm. and make the brain neurotic, make the brain fearful full of anxiety, guilt, shame, envy, greed, vanity, jealousy, all the rest, right? That's what the brain body is a slave to all this. Now, can the brain body be free, set, be set free from it all without taking time? You get it? Because time might be the factor that is preventing it from happening. If I say, if the me says, I'm going to take time, right? Read books, have more experiences, blah, 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 blah. All of that is a postponement for happening, for it happening now. So the me is always saying, not now. I'm not interested. Let me think about it. Maybe sometime in the future, right? So can we see what the me is doing? 
It's preventing inquiry. It's preventing us from finding out what is happening. So we can't, we can't listen to what others have said. We have to go within and find out for ourselves directly through self-awareness, looking into the mirror, right? Seeing the self, understanding the nature, the structure, uh, the movement of the self. A total understanding, right? I get it. And in that total understanding, liberation, which then gives birth to true love, true peace, true happiness, true creativity for the very first time. And it's not temporary. It's not an experience that only lasts a day, a week, a month. It's 24-7, beginning with the children at the earliest age. I mean, I, I don't think anybody who has less of that, I mean, if you're not thinking in terms of that, right? I mean, you just, I mean, this thing is burning. We're at the edge of a precipice. We are creating such havoc in the world, right? We can't wait another day to wake up, right? So uh, do we all feel that sense of urgency, that sense of demand? That comes from self-awareness, that you are the block, you are the noise, you are the contradictions, the confusions, the fear, right? All the beliefs are that. The brain is clinging to belief for security, a sense of security. It's a false sense of security. Thought made it up. Thought made up the belief. Thought, I mean, the belief is an abstraction invented by thought. It's not what's happening now, right? So, yeah, go ahead. Richard, yeah, we just have, I have another question over here. So I'm just going to address Marnie mm -hmm. there. Marnie. Maybe I could not mute no. my apologies. No so um, I, I somewhat see where Richard's coming from, but you know, and I practice Vajrayana, so I'm already enlightened. I just am totally obscured, of <laughs> course, by <laughs> by um, what I actually put in the questions. Uh, basically, this sutta is a, is saying that you know we get rid of you know attachment, aversion, ignorance, however you want to call it, that that's the highest level human beings can hope for based upon this sutta, right? Is that my understanding? The higher level you go, the more you get rid of basically. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of ideas flying around Marnie. Um, Richard, thanks for the comments. Marnie, thanks for the, the kind of the input. So let me, I, and I totally kind of understand where all these directions are coming from. So allow me just to say a few words about this distinction that's going to be made in the text between a so-called regular person and an arahat, this highly enlightened person, this highest level, as we might call it in that way. What we want to notice from the text is that it says that the common ordinary person perceives, whether it be earth, water, fire, air, or bahuta, beings, or devas, or pajapati, or brahma, whatever it is, the untaught ordinary person perceives these things. And the word that's being used there in the Pali, if you read the Pali version, is samya. So you might know, you might, obviously, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, you know that Samnya is one of our aggregates, one of those five constituent elements of a sentient subject. So perception. What I would like you to know, because I know maybe not everybody's looking at the Pali and the English, but we want to notice that when it comes to the Arahat, and actually this language, the language shifted when it got to a disciple in higher training. And it was the language of not perceiving these things, but having direct knowledge of these things. Now that word is abhinya, not samnya, but abhinya. Now, if you know Pali or Sanskrit, you know that the root of those words is the same. The root of both of those words is jna, 
jnana, knowledge. Ah, but there's many different kinds of knowledge in Buddhism. There is discriminatory knowledge, which is vijnana. There is associative knowledge, which is samjnana, which is called perception. And then there's this direct knowledge, abhinya. Often the word or the term abhinya is translated as super knowledge. But here it's just being translated as having direct knowledge. Now, the first thing that, ah, there's so many teachings going on in this sutta, but because the focus has become tonight about like, what is it to be enlightened? What is it to be free? What is it to be an arahat? Well, first, there's direct knowledge and not perceiving. Now, what does it mean? What is the difference between perceiving something, meaning samya, versus abhinya, direct knowledge? Well, allow me to use an example. So we often, or I often use this as a good example. So the idea here is, is that you might be perceiving a roll of toilet paper. And the idea here is, and now this is going to relate to some of the things that were addressed earlier, but what we want to notice about perceiving a roll of toilet paper is notice that, now if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you already know that this is not a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you know that this is my very, very delicate very fancy scarf, right? And I only really pull out this fancy scarf on rare occasions, but it's a cold night. And so I'm going to use my very fancy, very delicate scarf. Now, what I've just shown you is that the perception that this is a roll of toilet paper is a very narrow perception and if you start to think about it, or you start to look at it, which is what, why do you, why do you think this is a roll of toilet paper? Then you might start to unravel some of that mental conditioning that Richard was talking about earlier, some of that programming, some of that samskara, another one of the aggregates. But the idea is, is that to perceive things is to interpret something through past conditioning, past habits, past experiences. And so perhaps when you were being potty trained as a child, they were like, you got to use this, buddy. <laughs> no, no, use, you got to use the toilet paper. And then the mind became conditioned to associate this with bathrooms toilets, defecation, and so on. All of that, meaning the associating, associating this with bathrooms, defecation, sanitation, that's what samya means. Remember, sam, sam means to gather together. So a type of jnana, a type of knowledge based upon association. So again, what I want you to notice is that to perceive this as a roll of toilet paper is in effect to witness your own conditioning in that sense. Now, what would it mean though for a disciple in higher training or for an arahat to to directly know anything. Well, this is where, you know, I need to be very clear that I am only in that sense. No, no, I'm talking from certain firsthand personal experience, but I'm not claiming to be an arhat. So I'm not claiming to know what 
direct knowledge is in that way. However, the idea of it, which I feel like I can speak about because I know that it is not samya. So if it's not this kind of associative knowledge and an arahat, for example, directly knows earth as earth. So from a Buddhist point of view, this can be interpreted a number of different ways. But to, to basically treat, to treat this as a, a polytext representing the early tradition, to, to have direct knowledge of something is usually defined as having a direct awareness of its impermanence, having a direct awareness of its causing of suffering, and having a direct awareness of how there actually isn't a self there witnessing this. So that is the normal standard definition of abhinya in the Theravada or the Hinayana tradition. This kind of having the direct knowledge of the impermanence, the suffering nature. Yes, a direct knowledge of the so-called three characteristics of existence. Exactly. So that's sort of what constitute this constitutes this direct knowledge. Now, there's two ideas that I need to mention. Let me mention one really quickly. This is complicated, though. We might be here a little while on this one, or not. I don't know. So there's an idea that I I talk about, or I like I throw it out there every now and then. And it's one of those ideas that I talk about, I throw it out there, but we don't really discuss it. And I think the reason why I don't really discuss it that much is because, as you all know, I, I I lean I lean more Mahayana. And what that means is that I lean more emptiness of all dharmas. And what I'm about to say again, what I'm about to mention again, is very much a hallmark of early Abhidharma. So early Buddhist philosophy or metaphysics. And what that is, is, is that dharmas, all of them, like all of them, <laughs> All dharmas in Buddhism, like the, even the earliest schools of Buddhism, all dharmas are considered to be um, momentary. And that's basically because it's, it's really, com this is really complicated. Again, we could be here a long time. But although early Buddhism isn't isn't idealistic and what i mean by that is mind only eventually in the mahayana tradition buddhism becomes what we would call in the western philosophical tradition it becomes idealistic meaning it becomes mind only or consciousness only but early buddhism is it's very mind centric and what I mean by that is, is that from the early Buddhist point of view, to perceive, and I'm using that word intentionally, to perceive something as being solid, right? That is to observe, to perceive solidity. So that is to perceive what they would call the earth element, the solidness of something. But early Buddhism makes a difference, or it understands that there is a difference between the object, which is solid, and the mental phenomena of perceiving solidity. I, I know that was probably very overly complicated, but 
most basically Buddhism is all, early Buddhism. If you're familiar with these terms and I hate to throw out too many technical terms, but early Buddhism is phenomenological. So it already is dealing with what it considers to be mental phenomena arising and ceasing. Whoop, 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 whoop. And so from that perspective, a Dharma, and let's remember technically in the world of Buddhism, a Dharma is the object of the mind, right? It's the sense object of the mind. Well, Dharma's mind objects basically last a thought moment and then they go away and in the next thought moment a new dharma arises that is probably conditioned and influenced by the the prior thought so it looks or feels a lot like the prior thought but it is actually a new dharma and so early buddhism they often use the example of swinging a um uh, what they call basically swinging a uh, fire and you you might have seen this but if you take like a stick of fire and start spinning it fast enough you will see a circle of fire. And that's because the individual moments of the flame being here, the flame being here, the flame being here, the flame being there, because it's going so fast, it creates a kind of optical illusion of a solid circular circle of fire. Early Buddhism uses that analogy a lot to refer to what we would call, or what they call chitta sentana, the continuity of, of chitta, the continuity of mind. So your sense of being you all the time, you're a fire wheel. And it is thought moment to thought moment to thought moment to thought moment, but they are happening so quickly that it just feels like it's just you thinking rather than these dharmas coming into existence and out of existence and into existence and out of existence. I say all of this because I know that when I first started studying Buddhism, I thought impermanence was about how if you wait long enough, ice melts. But actually, the impermanence, the, the, the anicca in that sense, the impermanence of these things is actually very impermanent because they are momentary. And the basic idea is, is like, oh, look, I'm having this thought. Whoop! On to the next thought. Oh, on to the next thought. And so each of those thoughts is so impermanent. It doesn't last longer than a thought moment. Now, that, that what I just described, meaning everything's actually kind of popping in and out of existence and is extremely impermanent, but there's this perception of continuity, if you will. Well, there is a disconnect between those two realities. The reality that is thinking in terms of permanence and the reality of impermanence. And there's a, therefore there's a friction between those two things. And that causes dukkha. That causes this coarse roughness in that way, the suffering. So I want you to just notice how there's a relationship between impermanence and dukkha, suffering. And by the way, there's a connection between those and the third characteristic, which is this anatta, anatman, the no self characteristic. It is the delusion that there is a self here experiencing this that then in a way 
you know, which comes first, you take your pick. But the idea is, is that that, that diluted sense of self is what suffers and thinks things are permanent when really they're impermanent. But that sense of self, that sense of a permanent self arises from thinking things are permanent, not impermanent. So I, I just want to show you how the three characteristics are intimately related to each other in that sense. So all of that was to talk about how your uneducated or untaught person perceives things and thinks they are those things or thinks of themselves as not those things or thinks of themselves as in those things. They delight in things. The arahat, however, we are told, has this abhinya, this direct knowledge of the impermanence of all dharmas, the suffering of all dharmas, that there's no self there to all dharmas. So that's the difference between, well, the first difference between an arahat and a so-called ordinary person. Okay. Now I want to mention another really important thing about how our arhat is introduced. So this paragraph actually begins with the Buddha saying, bhikkhus, bhikkhus who are arahats with the taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, who have reached their own goal, who have destroyed the fetters of being and who are completely liberated through final knowledge, they too directly know earth as earth and water as water and fire as fire and so on. And having directly known earth as earth, they do not conceive of themselves as earth they do not conceive of themselves as in earth. They do not conceive of themselves as apart from earth. They do not conceive of the earth to be mine. They don't delight in earth. And why is that? Because they have fully understood, I say. So now let's talk about Asvara. So asvara is the word that is being translated as taints, the taints in that way. So an arahat by definition is considered anasrava. So without asrava. But what does asrava mean? Now it is translated as taints and a Arahat, by definition, has destroyed the taints, destroyed the asrava. So they are anasrava. Well, the traditional, the traditional kind of uh, translation of anasrava, anasvara, sorry, is without outflows no outflows. And so an asvara is actually an outflow. Now, it's interesting to know what these outflows are. Now, I want to remind everybody, I'm giving you kind of a very traditional Theravada definition of all of these things. It's, it's think it's appropriate to this sutta that we're reading. But the basic idea of the asvara, the outflows, these were, are, depending on who you talk to, outflows of bodily liquids. In particular, one second, James. So in particular, what they talk about is tears saliva, and let's call it sexual secretions, right? So this could be, you know, for men and women, sexual excretions are different, but we, we all do it though, or we both do it in that sense. 
And then there's saliva and then there's tears. This is a traditional definition or description of the outflows. And so by definition, the arahat has cut off the outflows of tears, saliva, and sexual fluids. Now, in some traditions that I've read about, this is all kind of metaphorical. But in other traditions I've read, it is quite literal. And what I mean by that is, is that arahats, to be an arahat means you no longer cry. You don't shed tears anymore. You also don't salivate in the sense that you don't crave and you don't like get excited in that way. And then of course, the major one for an arahat is that an arahat does not emit sexual fluid. In terms of the male, the male arahat, of course, what this means is, is that there is no more emission of semen. This is a hotly um, debated topic, by the way. I just want everybody to know that I am aware that this is a very hotly debated topic in the world of Buddhism, even the world of early Buddhism. It's sort of about like a kind of, um, well, there's sort of the more scientifically minded that sort of think these things are, quote, impossible in particular, the state of basically transcending sexual arousal in that sense. Um, I would imagine anybody who is affected by sexual stimulation couldn't imagine <laughs> such a state in that way. But my point is, is that let's remember that the early Buddhist tradition in particular, it really advocated monasticism and celibacy and the early tradition really advocated a certain kind of emotional equilibrium, if you will. Meaning the early tradition was about cultivating a kind of, um, well, a, a kind of equanimity that would certainly not evoke tears in that sense. Now, the point is, is that an arhat by definition, and this is where we're back to our, our opening question, technically, categorically, an arahat is considered this highest state attainable by a human being. And in the early Buddhist tradition, that highest state was marked by this no longer basically getting worked up and excited about the things of the world, whether that's sexual things, things to eat, or emotional things of the mind and heart. Again, I don't particularly advocate that type of Buddhism, but we're talking about it because that's the kind of sutra that this is. So, Okay, now there was a question in the comment about the, the practicality of all of this. So let's see, what is the practicality in all these teachings? So the practicality in all of these teachings is about suffering and not suffering. That is always the practicality of Buddhism. And at the beginning of the of the of tonight, there was this uh, this call, a call for this to happen here and now. Right. I remember this. There was this call. I think it was Richard, this call, like, but it was about what can happen here and now. And that is indeed the total practicality of all of this is that Buddhism is talking about a way of not suffering. Now, <laughs> there are methods and techniques for not having anxiety, stress, worry, fear, all of it, anything that you would categorize as suffering, there is a way to not have that experience anymore. That's the practical nature of it. Now let's talk about what is causing it. Well, of course, there are a variety of things, but in Buddhism, it boils down to just three. And they were also in one of the chats, in one of the notes, these three were evoked. The three things that are causing this suffering is the greedy wantiness, the angry aversion, and this delusion about the self. Those are the three problems. 
And so the beauty of this teaching, the beauty of this tradition, and I know that at first this sounds harsh or rough, but then we realize, ah, but this is good news. What can sound harsh or rough at first is the idea that all suffering is self-imposed. We just, we heap it on ourselves. The good news is that you can stop doing that immediately. That's the, the beauty of that teaching is the bad news is, is you're doing it to yourself, but the good news is, is you're doing it to yourself in that way. So tonight, because of the nature of the sutta, let's do it this way. I mentioned that these three kleshas, these three defilements, these three afflictions of the mind, right? Raga, Devesha, and Moha. Normally transit is greed, anger, and delusion. One of the things that I often like to point out is, so raga, the, the like addictive, needy, wanty, give, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. What we want to notice about raga, like the wanty, give me, give me, give me. It only functions when there's an idea of a me there. Give me. I'll be happy if I get that. I'll be cool if I get that. They'll like me if I get that. So there's this me sitting underneath all cravey wantiness. We could also notice that there's a me underneath the get away from me i don't like you i don't like that i don't want that anywhere near me notice that there's a me that has to be there to be angry to be averse to be you know bitter there's got to be a me under there that feels offended that feels hurt that feels whatever so my point is is that we could talk about the greedy wantiness, we could talk about the anger and the aversion, but because of the nature of the sutra tonight, we're going to talk about the root, the mula, the root cause of the self. Yeah, Richard, we're, we're getting to this self. I, this has been a very, you know, intentionally crafted Dharma talk going on here to try to set up certain ideas about this self. And my hope is, is that then when I just pull that little self rug out from underneath this, it'll all be revealed. So again, I already pointed out how the affliction of wanty greediness and the affliction of aversion are kind of based on this sense of self. Now, this whole sutta is about how, well, what makes an untaught person untaught is this glomming on or this attaching to whatever, whatever it is as self. And what the arahat, we are told, is that the arahat doesn't do that. And let me just mention this because I, I, I just want to get this one out of the way. <laughs> so... So this idea of, of the self, so for example, Richard has a note here that oh, disappeared on me, but it was an interesting way of putting it. So it's this idea that the self, lowercase or uppercase, is an illusion put together by thought. And what we want to start thinking about now, Richard, is that idea is, okay, so what's that thought? By the way, Richard's comment is correct. It's an illusion kind of created by thought in that way. And that's where we, for tonight, are we're going to lean a little more Theravada Hinayana. And what I mean by that is, is that 
indeed, we're, this is not about turning thinking or thoughts into anything in that way, Richard. What we want to notice is, is that if, if I may, we want to notice that selfing, and I'm now turning it into a verb, I guess an adverb, it's an adverb, right? Selfing. So we want to think about, we want to be good Buddhist in this way. And the, so the first thing that I want to do is, is I want to get rid of the idea that there is a self. And, and by the way, I don't want to sound like I'm just, I don't want to be a bad philosopher. Yeah, I don't want to be a bad philosopher. So I can't just do that, right? I can't just say that there's no self. I've got to show you that there's no self in that way. The normal Buddhist way of doing that is by noticing that when we talk about the self, if we really think about it, we have no idea what that is. And what I mean by that is that, is this. It's the question of, and this is for the benefit of anybody who hasn't, because there's a lot of, lot of seems like a, a some new people here. So really quickly, let me just walk you through this. This is a tr classic thing that the Buddha always does in the suttas. And what it is, is it's the question about my hand. My hand. If we notice that I have a hand, I, in fact, I have two hands. What that reveals, if you just look at the language of it, what that reveals is, is that I don't think that I am the hands. I think I have hands. I have a teacup in my hand, meaning that there is a possessor, an owner, one who has hands. Okay. What has hands? And that's where all of a sudden, we realize that we use this word all the time, me, self. But if we think about it, we actually don't know what we are referring to. Are we referring to the body? No, because we say we have a body. Are we referring, are we referring to our voice? No, I have a voice. This is the sound of my voice which means I don't think I am the voice. I think I am making noises. I'm making noises. I'm thinking. What's thinking? And by the way, Richard, this was like a roundabout way to get to your idea, which is the, okay, thoughts, imagining a self. Like, what is that? And then that's where we begin to realize, or this is what I wanted to set up. Ah, the self isn't a thing, it's a verb. It's a doing. It's not a thing, it's a doing. And that doing is related and not just related, it is a doing that, <laughs> The perception of the doing arises from what they call upadana, appropriation. So mind, and notice that I'm not saying my mind or your mind or her mind. I'm saying mind has a tendency to appropriate. And appropriation means my cup. I often like to point out that ownership, like the idea that this is my cup, is an illusion. Meaning it's an impression. It's an impression that I'm under, that it's my cup. 
meaning it's a disposition that I have towards the cup, which is that it's mine. Well, that appropriating mind appropriates. It's a habit. It's a samskara. And not only does mind appropriate, but it also then goes, ooh, mine. And this appropriation, the habit of appropriation, the samskara of upadana in Buddha Dharma, it is that samskaric habit of appropriating that doesn't stop. And what I mean is it goes, my cup, my hand, my language, my words, my thoughts, rather than speech happening, thoughts happening, cup. There's this appropriating of it, which is the mind. And that is exactly the language that our sutra keeps referring to where remember it says that the uneducated or sorry, untaught ordinary person perceives the earth to be mine. And that's the uh, upadana, that's the appropriating. So if you want to, if you want to know what, or if you want to know the source of the problem, it's appropriating. And it's not, again, I want to point out the levels of this. You can appropriate stuff. And as I often like to point out, one moment, Rich, I just want to get this thought off. As I often like to point out, if I'm under the impression that this is my cup, that I like own it, that it's mine, if somebody comes along and grabs it and runs away with it, suffering and the suffering is arising the anxiety of like they stole my cup the anxiety is arising from my attachment and clinging my upadana my appropriating of the cup an untaught ordinary person thinks that that person that stole my cup is the cause of my suffering they are not the cause of your suffering your attachment or appropriation of the cup is the source of suffering because I, I will show you why. If I didn't appropriate the cup, meaning I didn't own it, I was just using it. If somebody came along and grabbed it and ran away with it, No suffering because there's no clinging. Clinging, it gets stolen, I suffer. All right. Oh, and by the way, too, my upadana, my attachment or appropriation of stuff can lead to violence. The Buddha talks about the picking up of stick and sword to defend property as a result of upadana. So let's just notice that at a basic level of appropriating stuff, there's problems, there's suffering. But now what we're talking about is that same delusion of mind that appropriates things and thinks it owns them. Ha ha ha. That same mind appropriates body. That same mind appropriates mind as my mind. And guess what happens as a result of that appropriating of the body? I hope Father Time doesn't come steal my body. My point is, is that in the same way that I can be attached to the cup through clinging, and then if somebody takes it away, I can suffer. Insofar as I'm clinging to this body as self, Health issues frighten me, and that's called dukkha. If I didn't have that desperate attachment to the body as self, I would recognize physical phenomena as physical phenomena. 
in that sense. So that's my kind of few things that I wanted to get off just regarding the practical application of all of this. It's about suffering or not, and the mechanisms that cause suffering or not. Richard. Okay, so ask yourself, where did all those words come from that you just came out of your mouth? No idea. They came from the active memory. You well, read that's, one, that's one answer, Richard. Richard, you, you have a lot of answers. I just want to point this out, Richard. No, look you, at it. Look you have a lot of answers. and I, so I No, don't I don't know have why, an answer. Why you're I'm here. saying, <laughs> I'm inviting you to look at it, right? You're I, a I bundle you. of active memory, and you're always thinking from that program, that program, you've been highly conditioned. Your brain is not free. Your brain is clinging for security, for dear life to the mind, the I, the me, the self, because it that is fear. So, so what is the me? So everything, everything you're thinking right now, all your reactions, your irritations, your antagonisms, right, your hurts are coming from this active memory. So you're always reacting, you're never responding. You're reacting from the past. It's the past, it's not what's happening now. Which means what? That means you're not paying attention. You're not listening. You're never ever present. You don't see the bird, the cloud, the tree. You don't listen to the music. You don't see your children, right? You see your image of them, which is a limitation, imitation and distortion. So you're living in a dream, right? And we're talking about waking up, right? Not temporarily as an experience, right? But 24-7, beginning with the children at the earliest age. So I'm asking, what is, how, how does this arise without taking time? Or it may take, I don't know, uh, 60 minutes maybe, but that's it. Right? But the actual event has nothing to do with time. It's like being hit by a lightning bolt. I get it. There's a getting, not I get it. There's a getting, which then there's a scene of truth, and the truth sets the brain, body, totally free from the mind, the me, the I, which is the maker of all illusions. It's the maker, it's the dreamer, making up stuff. Right? It's make It made up Buddhism. So... Richard, it made the what, sutras. If I may. It made the rituals and the techniques, right? So what Richard is describing is representative of this Theravada early school of Buddhism. And I say that because it is the early school of Buddhism that sort of still believes in a brain. And Richard has evoked a few times the idea of a, a brain. Now, the point is, is that only certain schools of Buddhism are still sort of thinking in terms of physiognomy or biology. And my point is, is that from a certain more developed Mahayana point of view, we have to understand all of these things as arbitrary distinctions. Meaning even this brain that's having these ideas is another discrimination of mind. So my point is, is that there's a lot, Richard, my point is, is that there's a lot of different ways to explain this sutra, to explain Buddhism, to explain what's going on. And I'm just trying to get across actually a bunch of different ways of understanding rather than actually making any declarative statements about what's really going on, always a dangerous idea, frankly, what's really going on. And I'm, again, I'm sort of just putting out there a number of possibilities of how to understand this with a little bit of etymology thrown in for fun. That's kind of all that's really going on here. So, Noam, you mentioned that somebody else had a question. Yeah, I, I, let me see, I'll read it out loud. It was when you were talking about the, how one oh, became- right. And she talked about the Brahma, Brahma ah. cultivation. So I wanted to mention that, Noam, because last week you mentioned that. So last week, 
we are, we're talking more about, or I got more into talking about these uh, levels of what are known as the realm of form. So it begins with, um, we were talking about from the sutta, we were talking about how the untaught person perceives Brahma as Brahma. And having perceived God, or at least one of the gods, Brahma, as Brahma, they conceive themselves in Brahma, or they conceive themselves apart from Brahma, or they conceive Brahma to be mine or to be me, and they delight in Brahma. And then the next section is about this Abhasvara, Abhasvara, these gods of the Abhasra heaven, the streaming radiance gods. And then there's the refulgent glory gods, and then the gods of great fruit. And last week, there was a question, Noam raised a question about these traditional four Buddhist meditations known as the Brahma Viharas the abodes of Brahma, which are four in number and correspond to these four immeasurable mind states, um, kind of loving kindness, compassion, um, empathic joy, and equanimity. And then there was a question, there always is a question about whether those four Brahma Viharas correspond to what are traditionally known as the four dhyanas or in Pali jhana. And of course, as you know, there's these four deepening states of what is called meditative absorption, right? And it would seem, so I would, it would seem that this sutta, no, last week I kind of like said, well, Maybe they're the same, maybe they're not the same, meaning maybe the four jhanas are the same as the four Brahma Viharas. This sutra seems to equate them, or I would read it as equating them. Now, what I didn't really mention last week is Brahma, and I have mentioned this before, but remember, Brahma is the god of the realm of form. And when we say form in this way, rupa, we are talking about the realm of earth, water, fire, air, the, the realm of elemental form in that way. Not the realm of desire, not the realm of projecting all of your psychodramas onto the world and all of that, but just sort of the elemental world. And the idea is, is that if you get into the first jhana, you are kind of welcomed by Brahma, by Brahma. Brahma's like, welcome to the first jhana, welcome to the first Brahma Vihara. And that's sort of what it means in a way in the sutta when it's saying that when an ordinary person, when they perceive Brahma, well, I think the sutra should be read that when an ordinary person gets into a meditative state and experiences Brahma, experiences God, they think of themselves either as God or in God or not the same as God, but their sense of self is relative to that deity in that way. The idea is, is that if you move into the second jhana, you are in a way greeted by or among these gods of streaming radiance. So these are considered gods of like, or beings, I should say, they are devas, but they are beings of light. And then actually, if you get really into the tradition, there's actually subdivisions of this uh, Abhasvara heaven, where there's like the gods of like a little bit of light, <laughs> a medium amount of light, and then like so brilliant, you can't really even look at them in that way. 
Then when you move up into the third jhana, you are greeted by these gods of refulgent glory, the Subhakritsna gods. And then upon the fourth jhana, that's where these gods of the Brittapala, the great fruit gods, hang out. So the idea is, is that this sutta is talking about these meditative states what might happen to you in that meditative state, which is that you might see something or something to that effect. And by the way, of course, this doesn't stop at the realm of form, but it eventually goes on to the base of infinite space, the base of infinite nothingness, the base of it, or the base of infinite consciousness, the base of infinite nothingness, and then the base of neither perception or non-perception. Now, if you know sort of your basic dharma, those are the four formless jhanas, also called the formless samadhis, although samadhis are usually formless. So we are being taken on a journey from the realm of form, up through the jhanas, up through the formless jhanas, and then, after the state of neither perception nor non-perception, it's about anything seen. So the untaught person perceives the seen as the seen. And by the way, this is S-E-E-N, not S-C. Right? So this is the that which is seen. But the noble arahat here directly knows the scene as the scene. And having directly known the scene as the scene, they do not conceive of themselves as the scene in that way. And then the heard, and then the sensed, which if you read uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnote, that's about smelling and tasting kind of combined in that way. And then the cognized, anything thought about, anything conceived of or cognized. An untaught person perceives the cognized as the cognized. And having perceived the cognized, they think they are the cognized. This is what I was talking about earlier with this idea of I am, those are my thoughts in that way. And then unity and diversity. So the untaught person perceives unity. And then the next one is diversity. But the arahat is directly knowing what unity is, directly knowing what diversity is, and is not thinking of self as either in unity or in diversity. And then second to last is the idea of sarva, everything, the all. The untaught person perceives everything, the all, as everything, the all, and then either perceives themselves as that or apart from that. And then the last one is nirvana, nibbana. And this idea of either directly knowing nirvana or not directly knowing nirvana. And it's the untaught person, we are told, that would say or even think, I'm in nirvana. Or they would or they could think I am nirvana, whatever it is. So Let's rewind a little bit. This sutra is called the root of all dharmas. And I'm hoping that we can now see how it is that this sutra addresses all dharmas. Because it begins with the very building blocks of phenomena, earth, water, fire, and air, and then goes to beings of all different sorts, all different realms, 
And then it goes all the way to the very idea of anything seen, heard, sensed, or cognized. And then even the idea of everything, <laughs> diversity, and then finally even nirvana. And so what I was saying, or what I had mentioned a number of times last week, the sutra is saying that the arahat for tonight does not conceive of themselves as earth, water, fire, air, a bhuta, a deva, a brahma, or any of these things. And what I mentioned last week, I'll say it again, is now you might be wondering like, well, then what does the noble arhat think the self is? And that's where we say, no, 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 no. They don't. <laughs> that is what anatta means, no self. Okay, let me pause there. Questions, comments, answers, ideas. I know there was a lot in the comment. Okay. Cool. No. Um, just following up on something we talked about last week, it's, it's a, it's a comment, but it's really a question. It's a comment to myself. Like, I just want to study more the order that all this comes in. Cause you talked a little last week about, I think it was last week about, it's just interesting that the gods are in the, are, are, you know, part of the first for jhana is not it's related to what we've talked about before where the gods come to get advice from buddha you know ah. but then it's just interesting that where it goes from the from the form jhanas the formless jhanas then to per perceptions perception right the senses the scene yeah the scene the the heard the sensed the cognized, and then unity and diversity, and then mm. all, and then nibbana. It's just, I just want to think about that more, but I'd love to hear what else you have to say about that. Yeah, I think one of the things to keep in mind about what's going on with the sutra, and thanks, Noam, because I hadn't really thought about it this way. I think one of the things to really think about with this sutta is that it there's a way in which Not, not Buddhism, but other religions and even other Indian traditions. There's a way in which there's a kind of um, a hierarchy of existence. And it's the idea that down here on earth, it sucks. But up there in heaven with the gods of glorious radiance or whatever. There's the idea that it's better in heaven. I, again, I, I, this is not Buddhism, of course, but I think that this sutra is addressing the commonly held idea that the kind of the higher up you go, and, and there is a traditional verticality to this, right? Where the second jhana is higher and the third jhana is even higher. I, I still, by the way, I still wonder if, if our heads were down there and our butts were up here, would, would heaven be down there and hell be up there? I bet it would, is all I'm saying. But I'm going to go along with it, that the idea that up going up is better that's a kind of a classic idea. And it's not just, of course, in, in India. The, mo many cultures up there, the more you get up there, the better it gets. And the deeper down there you get, the worse it gets. This is counteracting and going against all of that by saying, no, there's the delusion of self in all of those realms. And this is what we talked about, I think maybe not last week, but a few weeks ago. That is why the, the gods come and talk to the Buddha because they are actually, even though they're a God, they still have a self-identity as that God. 
And this is talking about all of that. Now, so what I mean to say, Noam, is this kind of, I find the order of this sutta, it is addressing the idea of where's the real? Like, where's the, the reality? Is it in the realm of form? Oh, no. Formless realm? No. Oh, in unity, in diversity? Nirvana. Nirvana's got to be like the real, right? And notice how even nirvana isn't it in that way. And of course, dharmically speaking, let's remember that nirvana, which means that cessation, right? That blowing out. The idea of nirvana is that it is the eradication and the ending of that persistent delusion of self. So how could there be any idea of I'm in nirvana? That is like an utter oxymoron or what have you in that way. So, all right, Noe. Thank you. Uh, yes. So in the, with the language, it's like when I say you, well, you need to, what you need to do, here's what we, you, mm. it always is pointing, the four fingers are always pointing back <laughs> at me. And therefore, that's an interesting language uh, uh, of the idea of language is, it's difficult because I can speak of my experience, quotation marks, but I don't know anything about yours. Mm. You know, I don't know. So thank you. I just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Noe. And on on that note, a very important note, it's it's for me as as like a kind of like amateur philosopher in that way, it's what makes Buddhism and Buddha Dharma very interesting to me. Because what it's talking about is, let's say I'm going to uh, riff, I'm going to riff off of what Noe just said. It's this idea about knowing somebody else's experience, like, and the idea is is that, you know, you know, in some traditions I can know your mind and experience, but barring any superpowers in that way, it's not that. Yeah, I can't know your experience, but what I can know is the cause of suffering, meaning the mechanisms that cause suffering. Uh, so once again, if you didn't catch it earlier, greedy, wanty attachment and angry aversion and delusion of self are what are causing the mess, right? So I may not know like, your experience of suffering, but I can understand the mechanisms underneath it because it's the same dharmas, the same principles governing all suffering. And it's why eventually you could actually then empathically understand the suffering of all beings by understanding the dharmic principles operating underneath them. That is the like the commonality, if you will. So... Just want to address that, Noe, because you mentioned that idea. Any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Cool. Well, then I think I think I'll pause there then. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, yeah, Noe, please. My pleasure, Marnie. Yeah, no. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just real quick, the the remembrance of what is what is the lifespan, the sutra when we talked about that. What is mm. the lifespan? But a single breath was the response of the of the, and the Buddha says yes, you understand. 
And I like this single breath when we were talking about the idea of what's this, what's this, what's this, that Richard's referring to this moment, this moment, this moment, this breath, this breath. And one day I will not have another breath. Hopefully not today. <laughs> At some point, the breath will be gone and I will exhale and not inhale. But that's not today. But I like the idea of that well, my life is this moment and this moment. You, you could you could also wake up right now, Noe, and realize it is not you inhaling or exhaling now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But just a just an application of the teachings in that. <laughs> it it avoids that problem of the last breath if you realize that it there's again no ownership of the breathing, no appropriating of the breathing. Just let it breathe. 